For today, um, we have our three GLOBE teams. Um, that's Skyline Earth Team, Pinnell Earth Team, and Antioch Earth Team. Um, so each team will take turns um, presenting the work that they completed throughout the year. Um, they also have included some summaries about um, the non-research aspect of the internship that they've completed, other restoration activities. Um, and then we have left time after each presentation for you all to ask any questions um, for each team individually. And as Charlie mentioned, we'll leave time at the end for any participants, either interns or our project partners to share any reflections or any stories that you have about working with our team throughout the year. Um, so while the presentations are going on, we're just gonna ask everyone to stay muted. Of course, unless you're an intern presenting, just unmute yourself whenever you're ready to present. And so Skyline, you're gonna take the lead now. All right, and we uh, ask that we hold any questions to the end of the presentation. Um, you can type them directly into the chat box now so you can remember, um, but you can just unmute yourself when it's time for questions. So I'm now gonna hand it over to Ed from Skyline to start us off. Um, if you didn't already know, I'm Eduardo Villarcortes. I'm from Skyline Earth Team and a new 2020 graduate. Uh, so today we're gonna be talking about algae blooming in our local community watersheds. And um, that's about it. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy this presentation and continue on. Uh, so here's Skyline Earth Team. Next slide. Okay. Our research is about why algae blooms in some water more than others, because it's important to understand this so we know how to help the environment. We use the, we use the hydrosphere um, grow protocol to test water transparency, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH level, alkalinity, and nitrate. The results of our research is that there needs to be a good balance between all of these factors to stop toxic algae from blooming. Our conclusion is that the higher most of these factors are, the more toxic more toxic algae there will be. Next. Um, this is our hypothesis and question slide. The different hypotheses we came up with were the amount of pollution and chemicals that are present in certain areas cause algae to bloom in those, in those places. Excess nutrition, nutrients in the water such as nitrate and phosphorus, which are found in most plant fertilizers, cause algae blooms. High temperatures and lots of light cause blue-green algae to bloom. Knowing why algae blooms in some bodies of water more than others is important to know because that means that certain bodies of water are high in nutrients. If water is stagnant or contains an excess of nutrients, has a high concentration of chemicals, and is prone to sunlight or high temperatures, then the amount of algae growing would be higher. Some may have to do with litter that could have gone into a body of water. In addition to that, runoff may have gone into a water source or stream, therefore affecting algae growth. Next slide. So our background information is that researching this topic is important because the quality of the water can have an impact on us since the water could go into streams and into our water source. The locations we decided to test the water quality at our homes to many fish and other animals. This topic addresses our local water sources and if they contain unhealthy amounts of algae because it can be damaging if there is too much algae bloom. For our research, we use hydrosphere globe protocols to understand the health of the water and how hospitable the body of water is to aquatic life. What we know already about this research topic is that when algae grows and dies, it takes oxygen out of the water. If this were to happen on a larger scale, it can deplete oxygen to the point where other creatures can't live in it. Some reasons why algae blooms are are there because are because of bird feces, and they are also rich in these nutrients. So places with larger bird populations are likely to have more algae blooms. This could be why so many algae blooms are at Lake Merritt and the change of sea currents and increase in water temperature are other factors. Climate change contributes to algae blooms by warming the earth as well. Next slide. Um, we originally wanted to study and try to find out why toxic algae was blooming in our local bodies of water and watersheds. Our study sites were Lake Chabot, Lake Merritt, and Sausal Creek. 
During our actual fields, we were separated into three different groups. One would use the LAMO water and wastewater testing kits. The second would take down metadata, and metadata is data that describes things like the weather, the sky conditions, and other information on how the study site looks. And the third group would pick up litter or survey park goers. The LAMO water and wastewater kit contains the instructions to test for pH, nitrate, alkalinity, dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, transparency, and temperature. Each kit includes an endpoint color chart, titration re reagents, and indicated tablets specific to what it tests for, as well as test tube pipettes and water tubes. When picking up litter, we take buckets, reachers, and grabbers, and use the marine debris tracker app. We followed all GLOBE's hydrosphere protocols, and an example of some are water transparency protocol, water temperature protocols, dissolved oxygen protocol, pH protocol, alkalinity protocol, and nitrate protocol. Our results show correlations between toxic algae and reduced water temperature, oh, transparency, my bad, higher temperature, more nitrates, a more basic pH, and a less dissolved oxygen, except in the case of merit, which we'll discuss later on. We conducted an analysis that worked to address the research question by comparing the presence of toxic algae in a body of water to, multiply, to multiple variables that could impact that presence. Now time for the next slide. These charts show different water quality tests and types of algae blooms. Okay, so the first graph on the top left shows all the water quality tests we conducted in di three different spots. Lake Chabot, who had more variety of algae, Salso Creek and Lake Merritt, both having only one type of algae blooming. It is important to note that there could have been some errors either in testing or writing down data. Next slide. From the graph, we can see correlations between toxic algae growth and temperature pH, dissolved oxygen, nitrates, and transparency. Lake Chabot was actually the only water body found with toxic algae and had the highest average temperature. This can be problematic as some aquatic species are sensitive to temperature changes. It also had a more basic pH than the other sites and was significantly higher in nitrates, which actually makes sense since they contribute to algae growth. The transparency was also significantly lower than that of the other two. However, the dissolved oxygen was lower in Lake Merritt than in Chabot. This is likely because Chabot has more connections to other water bodies like rivers, whereas Merritt is more closed off. These results help to answer our research question because they show correlations between certain variables and the presence of toxic algae. Some limitations to our results definitely center around the small amount of data we took and also the fact that some of the numbers are written incorrectly, causing confusion. Next slide. Uh <laughs> In Oakland, environmental problems are among many, but algae blooms don't usually come to mind. Although many can debate that algae blooms are good for the environment, uh, that is only true for a portion of the blooms. Talk to, uh, toxic algae blooms uh, are harmful, uh, and the ones commonly found in Oakland are in fact toxic. However, even non-toxic algae can be harmful if there's too much. It can deplete oxygen when it decomposes. There are various solutions to the problem of algae blooms, ranging from cleanup using specialized boats to efforts uh, to reduce runoff of nitrates and phosphates. Founds can spray systems that help bring more oxygen into the water during algae decomposition and can also uh, help mitigate the effects. Here's some links about the, shows you some examples on how toxic algae can be. Next slide, I guess. <laughs> okay, this is a summary of Skyline's Earth Day this year. Um, we have 1,414 total, total trash collected. Um, we have 2,550 square feet of total invasive species removed. Um, 13,200 square feet of mulch spread. Um, 136 plants installed and six total weekend events. Next slide. Um, here are a few pictures of the events we went to. So on the left, we have Friends of Salsa Creek, and on the right, we have the Hunter Patrol. <laughs> Next slide. Um, here is very Okay, and then our after school trip. Next slide. Um, we went to Berkeley Labs. All right, Jocelyn, would you like to uh, close out our presentation? 
All right, so so that pretty much sums up our presentation. We would like to thank everyone who's here for the program, East Bay Regional Park District, Small Creek, All Power Labs, Berkeley Lawrence National Labs, and last but not least, we would like to thank all of our guest speakers. So now, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Great job, Skyline Earth team. So if anyone has any questions, it can be our guests who are joining us, but also any of the interns, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask away. Hi, I'm Lisa Anich with Contra Costa Resource Conservation District and sounds like a really great project and I'm interested in how you identified what types of algae, uh, you know, what different kinds of algae there were because I've never done that. So mm -hmm. sounds interesting. So most of the algae that we identified was based off of what kind of texture that it looked like, like whether it was painty or like soup-like or if like it had like roots or whatever. So we didn't identify the exact species, but by looking at basically the way it appeared, we could tell whether it was toxic or non-toxic. If that answered your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for asking that question and thank you, Michaela, for answering. Does anybody else have any other questions? Tracy had a question in the chat box. Um, she asked, if you had to decide one factor for algae blooms, what would you point to? Does anyone else want to answer this or am I fine uh, to go ahead? Oh, you, you could go ahead. Yeah, you can no, go. No, you go. Okay. Hi. I mean, uh, did you want to go? Uh, I don't care. You, you could go if you want. All right. Um, I would probably point to the increase in um, different elements like nitrates and phosphates. Uh, they provide nutrition to a lot of plants and usually a, usually nitrates and phosphates are pretty, pretty rare because they have like slow cycles. But uh, because it's an increase because of runoff from like agriculture and stuff, I think that's the main, main reason there's more algae blooms now than there have been. It looks like Svetlana has uh, also asked a question. She says, what is one thing you learned besides science about working together, careers, or interests? I'd encourage any of the Skyline interns to unmute themselves and um, answer this question. What was the question? So Svetlana asked, what is one thing you learned besides science, whether it be about working together, careers, or your interests? Um, it'd probably have to be about my interests and that I'm like more interested in environmental science than any other science except astronomy. But yeah, that was like the only thing. Nice answer. Do, does anyone else from Skyline want to share their answer? Uh, I would say that um, definitely working together is a lot more effective than working alone. And we could accomplish a lot more if we work together than, uh, yeah, working on our own. And it could, it just changes it a lot. And yeah, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. That was a good answer. Definitely. I think we all learned um, how awesome it is to work together. We wouldn't have been able to do this research project or a lot of what we do in Earth Team without working together. All right, are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask Skyline Earth team? Going once, going twice? Okay. Well, thank you Skyline for your awesome work this year and your great presentation. Up next, it will be Penol. Do I go now? Yeah, Sean, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, hi everybody. Uh, welcome. This is Earth Team Panol. Next slide. Um, I'm Sean Jakes. I'm a junior at Panol Valley High. This is my first year in Earth Team, and I will be giving the introduction. Next slide. This is a photo of our team, except for a few who joined late in the year. Uh, 
Um, some of the reasons why we joined Earth Team was to be more involved and help our community, to learn about environmental issues and ways we can fix them. And we also joined to make new friends and improve our communication and social skills. Well, first of all, we care about all environmental issues, but some of the main ones are climate change, pollution, destruction of ocean habitats and all other habitats, and deforestation. Hi, I'm Trisha, and I'm a senior in the second year intern for our team. And here in Pernal Earth Team, we focus our work around and on the Pernal watershed. This watershed provides us a home and passage spray for significant steelhead rainbow trouts. And these trouts use this watershed to breed before heading into the ocean. Unfortunately, the creek is seeing a continual decrease of its trouts. This has been due to many factors, including shifting of land, poor water quality, and floods. Our team is trying to combat this issue, and along with Friends of Pernal Creek, we all work together to to make the areas around and on the creek stay clean through water testing and litter cleanup. This is done to prevent further destruction of the watershed. Next slide, please. And then in this map, you will see the blue line that is below Hercules, if you can see that, and that is the Pinal Creek watershed. I mean, the, the creek, yeah, the Pinal Creek. And so you'll see the arrow is the Pinal Creek, and that is the fish passage, which is what the um, picture on the right is. That is behind the bowling alley. Then the heart is the Pernal Native Plant Garden, which is across from our school and by the library. And the Pernal Valley High School with the smiley face is where we go to school and that's where we do most of our litter cleanup and also on the, um, the trail next to it. Next slide. Um, my name is Tao, and this is my first year at Earth Team. The intention of our research was to investigate the difference in water qualities in the Pinal Creek, located in the vicinity of Pinal Valley High School's campus, along with analyzing the various data found during our research and determining any trends in the creek. We also intended to juxtapose the various water quality tests taken in different areas of the creek. Next slide. Hi, my name is Carolyn and I'm a first time intern. And these are the locations where we did the water sample testing. We went to Pano, the Pano Library and we went to the Pano Valley Community Church. And we also did the fish, fish passage behind the bowling alley. All of this data was collected between December 2019 and February 2020. We had plans to keep doing water testing through March and April, but due to the coronavirus, we were not able to complete the data. Next slide. Hi, my name is Angelique, and this is my first year as an Earth Team intern, and I will be presenting the types of method used to collect information on the Pinole Creek. So usually we would collect once or twice a month on Thursday afternoons, and for the first method, we would use a dissolved oxygen kit. And dissolved oxygen is the amount of oxygen dissolved in water. And we would use sample water from Pinole Creek. And we would like shake together with an activator in a bottle. And if, the, if it turns yellow with the activator in it, that means that oxygen is present. For the next method, we use the nitrate kit. And nitrates is a form of nitrogen and can act as a nutrient in streams and rivers. And we would use sample water, once again, from Pinole Creek and mix it with an acid activator. And based off the chart, colors are compared to see if there's presence of nitrates. For the third method, we would take the temperature and it basically measures the average energy of water molecules. And we would do this test three different times just to have like an accurate measure of the temperature of the water. Since Pinole Creek is a cold body of water, it shouldn't exceed 68 Fahrenheit. Next slide. So for the fourth method, we would do a pH kit. 
which is basically a measure of how acidic or basic the water is. And this is as well repeated three times using a Kressel red indicator. And when it's mixed together, we would use an electronic pH probe to compare the results. And for the fourth method, we would use a turbidity test. And basically turbidity, it measures the amount of suspended particles such as algae in the water. And this was as well repeated three times where sample water will be filled in a large tube and there's like an image at the bottom of the tube. And that's how we would judge if the water was cloudy or not, if we could see that image clearly. For the final test, we would use an alkalinity kit. And alkalinity is important to fish in aquatic life since it protects against rapid pH changes. And this is as well repeated three times where sample water is taken and a tablet is dropped into that water sample and it should turn like a green bluish color then within then we would add like a second activator which should turn that purple indicating the presence of alkalinity next slide hi my name is june and i'm an art team intern for two years and hi this uh, my name is sean and I've been in our gym for two years. This is our graph and data analysis that June and I did. Next slide. I mean, next slide. Oh. can you go back? Please? And first is uh, our temperature at the three side. And this was measured in degrees Celsius. The temperature were consistent at um, each of the site. And for the library, the average temperature for four days were 12.7 Celsius, which was about 55.9 Fahrenheit. As at the church site, the average was 11.4 Celsius degree, which would be 52.4 Fahrenheit degree. And lastly, at the fish passage, the temperature was 13.16, and that would be 55.7 Fahrenheit degree. Here is our data for pH for, for the all three sites. pH is a measure of how acidic or basic the water is. Lower number means they are more acidic and higher number means they are basic. The pH was pretty consistent for all the places and sites and it is around 8.5 and it is alkaline. And this is our dissolve, dissolve oxygen measured in parts per million. Dissolve oxygen is the amount of oxygen that is present in water. Aquatic animals need dissolve oxygen to breathe. At six parts per million, it means it supports spawning. Higher than seven parts per million, it means it supports growth and activity. And higher than nine parts per million, it means it supports abundant fish population. And looking at the graph, the chart, um, you can see that at the library, the um, dissolved oxygens were higher than the church. And that is because even though they are in the same watershed, the church site were closer to the sidewalk, which means it's more prone to litter and urban runoff. And the library site were more extreme and so it's cleaner. And at the fifth passage, the this of oxygen was pretty healthy and it supports abundant fish population. Next slide. Hi, my name is Anna and this is my first year in Earth Team. To conclude this project, the Panocri habitat is healthy enough to support fish life. And how we determined this was by analyzing water qualities to understand if there were any shifts that can possibly threaten the habitat by utilizing tools such as probes, transparency tube, and thermometers. Based on the data, the temperature is all stable and pH levels for both categories maintain consistent. As for the dissolved oxygen PPM levels, the church is unstable, whereas the library is consistent. Hi, 
Hi everyone, my name is Maha, and this is my first year in our team. So two of the major types of events we worked on this year were native planting events and litter cleanups. For the native planting events, we did one at the Panol Library and, and one at Point Panol Shoreline. The Panol Library event was in November and it was in collaboration with friends at Panol Creek Watershed and Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. We planted 26 plants of nine different species. During COVID-19, we have been working to maintain the garden with help from friends of Pinole Creek Watershed. Another planting event we worked on was at Pinole, Point Pinole Shoreline on MLK Day. We planted 10 plants of five different species. For the litter cleanups, we helped, we, help, uh, we worked at the fish patches and near Pinole Valley. Um, near Pinole Valley basically means either on campus um, across the street at the church or the library. For the, for the fish passage, we collected 170 pieces of trash, which was mainly plastic. Near Pinole Valley, we collected 1,507 pieces of trash, which was mainly plastic. We collected a total of 1,673 pieces of trash throughout the year. To your left side, this is a poster of the native species we planted at the November event to our volunteers. To your top right side, this was the MLK event. To your bottom right side, this was the November event. These are the litter cleanups. To your left side is the fish passage and to your right side is the Pinole Library. Hello everyone, my name is Nora and I'm a first year intern for Pinal Art Team. So our first postponed event was our community service day, which was supposed to be held to give students an opportunity to gain community service hours, give residents of Pinal the chance to look and check up on their community and give Earth Team the chance to update their progress on the plants we planted in November. And so as a part of Earth Team, overnight trips are part of the schedule, but however, these were canceled. But this is where Earth Team students and interns can meet new people and other interns and learn about nature and the history that they are surrounded by. And in May, students were supposed to go to Bernie Falls, but that was obviously canceled. And our last postponed event was an educational event where on campus our team interns would have workshops to show fellow students what we have done, what we plan to do, and some of the other organizations that we've worked with. Next slide. Um, thank you for everyone's of Pinot, of Friends of Pinot, um, Contra Costa Research Conservation District, Pinot Valley High School, the GLOW program, and of course, everyone from Earth Team. My name is Norma and I'm a senior from Pinot Valley High School. And this is my second year working with Earth Team. Um, you, guys, you guys have been a great help to us and we appreciate that. Um, during my first two years of experience working with Earth Team, I learned many things such as doing water testing or soil testing and was able to create a garden from scratch. I gained more knowledge about many different types of plants and I also and also my communication skills have improved a lot compared to before. Um, because of Earth Team, I got to enjoy going on nature trips and appreciate the little moments. Um, I was able to try new activities that I never even imagined of doing before. And of course, along the way, I got to meet new people and was able to create new amazing friendships that I'll never forget about. My name is Rola and this was my first year being in Earth Team and I'm very grateful that I got to be a part of it because it's given me a lot of new experiences and fun memories and I was able to connect more with my environment and my community because that was something that I wasn't really in touch with and so through the events we had at Earth Team I was able to get in touch with all of that and I learned how to plant plants and I got to use that knowledge 
to garden the plants at the Pinot Library in November. And I also was able to take that knowledge and use it at home and plant my own plant and start my own garden at home. And um, I was also able to meet um, people from another Earth team, which was really fun because I got to see what the other Earth teams were like. And I got to go camping too for the first time, which is a really nice opportunity to have because I've never had the opportunity before and I might not again soon. So that was nice to do. And just in general, I'm very grateful that I got to be an Earth team because um, I was able to meet a lot of new people. Hello, my name is Nina Lim. I recently joined Earth Team during the quarantine, but so far the experience has been great, even if it's through Zoom calls. Um, I'm really happy I've been able to be a part of this, and I'm thankful. Um, hi, my name is Joey, and I'm a second year of Earth Team. And I would like to thank everyone again who helped us with our project and everyone who joined us in our presentation today. And I would like to open up this time for any questions you guys have. Thank you, Penel. that was awesome. Y'all did a really good job. Um, like Joey mentioned, if there's any questions, any participants, either Earth Team interns yourselves or um, our project partners, now is the time to ask. Okay, this is Lisa again from Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. I'm really impressed with all you've, you've done there. And um, I'm curious where, if, do you have a sense of where, what the source of the trash is, especially like at the fish, fish passage? Um, where do you think that trash is coming from? That's something I try to think about too, so that we can figure out how to reduce how much there is. I think that most of the trash when it comes to the fish passage is coming from like the freeway, you know how people litter and they just throw their stuff. So the wind is taking it to the creek. And then there's also the bowling alley. Um, there's Walgreens, there's a whole bunch of restaurants. So whatever trash isn't being put into the trash, it's just flying into the fish passage. Also the high school, the high school is right next to the creek also. So when the students would just like eat chips or anything and they would just throw it out on the. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. That's good. Thanks. Um, Tracy has a question. She asked, is there anything that you would do differently or change about your research project? For example, do you guys have like any I wonder questions after doing this research that I wonder if we would have done blah, 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 or I wonder if we would have gotten more, you know, samples or more data, you know, whatever it is. Do you have any I wonder statements? I was thinking that like maybe if we didn't like, oh, I can't talk, but um, I was wondering like if we didn't go into shutdown, like, like how different would the creek be? And I'm wondering like now, like is the creek better because a lot of more people are staying in the house. Like when we had a, um, we had a, a meeting with this lady, She's in, uh, she went for environmental science and she was telling us how they do water testing. And because of the, um, the they were in quarantine, that the air quality had actually gotten better. So I'm wondering like, could the creek have also gotten better? Awesome. And then Principal Kibbe asks in the chat box, um, do you look at Pinole Creek differently now that you've engaged with it in this way rather than how you'd seen it before? So do any of you think that your relationships with Pinole Creek have changed as a result of being on our team? Um, for me, yes, because now I'm, I, like, I used to not care about it as much. But working with Earth Team has helped me open my, like, look into things more careful and actually care about the environment and just anything around us. So it does have changed. Thanks. I, Nora, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's also changed for me because I see, like, a lot of our, like, fellow students from Pernod Valley High School, like, go there, hang out there. 
and like eat a lot of food after school and stuff and I think for me it's changed the way that I've looked at it because I have more of like a connection with it now and so like a lot of people litter there and so I feel like if I were to see that now I would be like 10 times more upset because like (laughs) one they're like polluting and like not doing good for the earth but two they're also just like ruining a good spot for the community so yeah thanks all right if there are no more questions then i think we can move on um thank you all for those questions those were all really great and thanks Pernol. you all did a good job all right our next and final presentation is from earth team Anyok. all right destiny go ahead Okay, so hi, I'm Destiny, and this is our presentation on assessing water quality of urban runoff on the Upper Sand Creek Basin. Um, Next slide. So, Antioch Earth Team is a group of 13 sustainable youth interns who go out of their way to practice and build their skills, educate others on how to take care of the environment, and learn more about environmental issues. Some of the skills our team members practice include monitoring water quality and restoring the Upper Sand Creek Basin, removing invasive plant species from the Antioch Dunes, and litter cleanup on both sites. Some of our environmental concerns include um, pollution in our local water resources, um, rising temperatures, factory waste affecting our local water resources, and invasive plant species in our areas. If you look at the bottom, you'll see um, images of the Antioch Dunes and the Upper Sand Creek Basin. Um, next slide. And here we have some portraits of our wonderful team members. We are just 13 kids who want to make a difference in our community. Next slide. Hi, hi I'm Luna and I'm a first year intern. Hi, I'm Delaney and I've been in our team for two and a half years and we're going to be talking about the project background on the Upper Sand Creek Basin. And so the Upper Sand Creek Basin was uh, or is a watershed and it was a very expensive um, project to like build the Upper Sand Creek Basin and get it to how it is now. Um, The first phase of like the Upper Sand Creek Basin was constructed in 1995 and um, historically the land was really used for um cattle and like farming um but they ended up expanding the land in 2013 and um they ended up completing it in 2014. This site is significant due to the many environmental benefits it provides including containing water to reduce flood risks providing 900 acre feet of storage enough to contain a 100 year storm without spilling significantly reducing the flood risk for Antioch, Brentwood, and Oakley residents living downstream along Sand Creek and March Creek, the planting of 2,500 willows, local storm drain system, innovative trash capture system, and for vegetating native plants such as cottonwoods, buckeyes, native roses, oaks, and other plants. Next slide. So this is like kind of like an overview of the basin. and there's really three different sites to it, and we will explain them. Just south of Sand Creek Kaiser Permanente in Antioch is the Upper Sand Creek Basin, which, as you can see, is also located off of Deer Valley Road between Antioch and Brentwood. The basin is lower than most of its surrounding area and has a water flow, keeping it cooler than most of Antioch. The area consists of a few small hills and a small area of willow trees, which help filter the sediment from the water. So we um, test out these three different sites um, for a bunch of different things, but really this is just an overview of the map um, and what it looks like and how it flows, you can tell. Yeah, next. Okay, hi, I'm Emma and I'll be presenting research objectives. So our objective was to figure out if the water quality from the Sand Creek outflow and the urban drool inflow were different or similar. Why? The urban drool runoff can affect the water quality in many ways, 
The runoff can carry pollutants that affect the water and its inhabitants. And this is why we research the water qualities. Next slide. Hi, I'm Aaron. And for me and Alexis Holland's part of the presentation, we covered reasoning for water quality testing and methods. Because um, while it's just as important to um, actually test the water in the Upper Grand Sand Creek Basin, it's just as important to remember why. Testing water quality can show what kind of pollutants are in our, our water, if there is more or less over time in the overall health of our watershed. And this is not only crucial to the environment, the health of the environment, but the health of the community as a whole. Next slide. Can you guys see me? Yes. We can see you. Okay. okay, I had to make sure because it wasn't like showing up on my camera. Um, hi, uh, my name is Alexis Holland and I will be talking about part one of our hydrosphere Protocols, um, one of them are nitrates. This test is due to the levels of nitrates in the Sand Creek Basin. While nitrates are essential to plant life, it can be harmful if the levels of the water are too high. And for dissolved oxygen, this test is done to determine the amount of oxygen in the water, which determines if the water, is, if the water can sustain life. Next slide. Hi, I'm back. Um, turbidity is the measured amount of suspended particles in the water. Um, this is important to keep levels of sediment and particles low as too many can have an adverse effect on the water. Um, we also test for temperature. Um, it's the average energy of water molecules and this is important for every other area such as bacteria, pH, oxygen, and just life in water. Um, next, we have pH and alkalinity. pH is relevant as it directly correlates to the health of the water, as many things like aquatic life um, breathing requires a certain level of pH. And alkalinity is important. It protects aquatic life from drastic changes of the pH levels. Alkalinity is a measurement of how acid can be in the water and still be considered safe. Next slide. Hi, I'm Shrey and I'll be presenting the results of our testing. We tested different areas that re represented water coming from different places in our community. The urban drill site represented water from urban areas and it contains human trash. The outflow is water leaving the basin. The willows represents the urban drill where it meets a creek surrounded by willow trees. And lastly, we have the Sand Creek inflow. The temperature of the water from the urban drill had dropped during January, but then rose up again during February. It appears the same thing happened at the outflow. However, the temperature we recorded was zero, which leads us to believe there might have been a testing error in um, testing, the, testing the, at the outflow throughout the day. Um, next slide. The pH of the water from all locations follow a more consistent trend of a pH between 8 and 9. However, at this pH level, we were concerned because it is outside of the healthy reading range, range which is between 6.2 and 8.2. So the pH at all of our sites were too basic. Next slide. And then the transparency from all our locations were relatively constant throughout our testing. However, on January 11th, there was a slight significant increase in the um, transparency at the urban drill and outflow site. Next page. We saw a pretty dramatic increase in the dissolved oxygen levels at, or decrease in dissolved oxygen levels from January to February at urban drill. So on January 10th, it was 10, and then February 1st, it was zero, and that was the date that we recorded. This is the opposite of what we found at the outflow. The outflow had an increase in the same amount of time. At this time, we also decided to start testing at the Willow site to see if there was something wrong with the water at the urban drool. And we did find that the Willows, where it was closer to the plant life there, it did have a pH or a dissolved oxygen of seven. Next slide. Level of nitrates at the outflow and inflow both increased at around the same rate, um, ju just at different dates. 
Next slide. The alkalinity level stayed pretty constant from November 19th to January 21st. We have a limited amount of data for the alkalinity because we ran out of the kits to test it. Next slide. Hello, uh, I'm Ivan. Uh, I don't have a camera, so sorry about that. But in conclusion, overall, the tests that we ran gave us a deeper understanding about the Sand Creek's water condition and quality. And the data we collected did tell us about a lot about the dissolved oxygen, uh, the levels of dissolved oxygen and how it decreased and the temperature increased over time, uh, like at places like the urban runoff test site. Um, but we also did test somewhere else, like the outflow test site, which showed that levels were higher of dissolved oxygen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so as much as we tested, um, there could have been some, a lot of possible errors, errors such as messing up on the test, which could have led to an incorrect or strange results and lead us to an incorrect analysis as well. It could have happened at, like with any of the tests. So really we took, we did take a lot of caution when performing the tests on the water and we were very careful about it. Going over our research, our next steps could be trying to use the information and in bettering the water quality, such as using, such as improving dissolved oxygen levels or removing nitrates if there's too much in the water. This will lead to a greater water quality and can be healthier for the animals and the environment around it. Next slide. Yeah. Hi, my name is Erica, and some other things we did other than our research project are. Um, litter cleanups, invasive species removal, and planting native plants. We also made awareness posters for climate change and endangered species. We have collected roughly around 1,854 pieces of litter from September 2019 to March 2020. We removed invasive, invasive plant, the invasive plant Russian thistle at the Anyak Dune. We went to the event giving natives a chance and we helped plant native grasses in Concord, California. We have worked on our resumes and professional skills, discussed climate change and endangered species, learned about our careers in the environmental field, and ad addressed water pollution in ways we think we could help. Next slide. Hi, I'm Gabby, and this is my first year in Earth Team. Uh, and these are some of the activities and events we had planned for the year. Uh, we had planned Earth Day, which was supposed to be celebrated on April 25th, 2020 at the Upper St. Creek Basin, but was postponed due to the COVID-19. Um, there was also a field trip to the Enyaq Dunes, which is a group of about 40 freshmen from Enyaq High School to, that they get to go to the Enyaq Dunes, a national wildlife refugee for a field trip organized by the Environmental Science Academy. During this field trip, Earth Team interns help give students an overview of the dunes and participate in restoration activities. And finally, we had planned the classroom presentations, uh, which, is, which are at the end of the school year. Uh, Earth Team members presenting classrooms, giving information about what Earth Team is and what kind of activities we do. Uh, and this is a way of recruiting new members for the next semester. Next slide. And uh, we'd like to say thank you to our Earth Team members, um, the Globe, the Contra Costa Resource Conversation, uh, Con Conservation District Flood Control, and uh, a special thank you to one of our teachers from Manioc High, Ms. Gavoni. She let us use her classroom for our Earth Team meetings. Um, so this was my first year on Earth Team, and it was a genuinely good experience. Um, I was interested in joining from the presentation done in one of my classes. I was just anxious at first because I didn't know much outside of that or anyone that was going to be in it. But when I went to the first meeting, I realized it wasn't that bad at all. Um, and most people were new, so everyone was in the same boat of like getting to know what, what was going on. And uh, it taught me a lot of things about the environment, um, how to run tests, you know, obviously turning the environment, and just how to work in a team, which was all really useful things that I don't think I would learn the same way doing something like in school or even a job. Um, but yeah, not only that, it was fun and enjoyable and I definitely want to do it again. Mariah, I think you're our last speaker. 
Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, my year with Earth Team has taught me a lot about working in a group and getting out into the environment and taking care of um, the environment. And it's taught me a lot about, like, you know, how to do water quality testing and what it is and why it's important. And um, I've learned a lot about how the earth is like something that we needed to take care of because we all live here. Awesome, thank you. Thanks Antioch um, for presenting, y'all did a really great job. Um, and once again, if anyone has any questions for the team, um, now's the time to ask away. And I believe Tracy actually had a question in the chat box. Um, Tracy asks, what might have occurred to result in inconsistent transparency data? So why was our transparency data a little inconsistent? And as before, anyone can answer. Because they were tested at different sites, right? Okay, yeah, that could be one reason. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah, again, this is Lisa from Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. And I, tell, I might have gotten this wrong, but I think you said you removed Russian thistle from Antioch Dunes. Is that correct? So I was, I've been to Antioch Dunes once, beautiful place, and I was just interested in Rus what is Russian thistle and why is it a problem and was it hard to take, you know, remove it or just anything you could tell me about the Russian thistle, I'd be interested. If you remember, we were at the Antioch Dunes the last know. day before um, we went into um, shelter in place. So Go like ahead. Russian thistle is kind of like just this big bush and it really has like one main root on the bottom and it's actually, it's actually quite easy to take out depending on, well, it grows in like a sand kind of, that's why mm -hmm. it's at the dunes. So it's quite easy to pull up because it's all just like, sometimes they're hard because the roots are thick but like because it's just like one it's not very long it's kind of like shallow roots so it's like it's it was easy to remove mm -hmm. yeah thanks and then one more question in the chat box from nicole sanderson um she says thanks you, thank you to all the teams um what is something that you learned that you share with people the most so something you might have learned throughout the year that you share with friends and family? I learned um, a little bit more like leadership skills, like each, cause I've been in Earth Team for like two years. So like each year I've learned a, bit, a little bit of like leadership skills and like better communication skills, I think. Yeah. Cool, thank you. You've actually been on Earth Team for three years now. I think you're our longest standing intern right now. Oh, wow. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you to everyone, all of our students who presented today. Um, and I think at this point, we'd like to open it up for anyone um, from our project partners who might want to share any reflections or any stories that you have about working with Earth Team this year. Yeah, I'd like to say something. Go ahead, Libby. <laughs> First of all, um, great job on all the presentations. Um, it was good to see the other teams. So I mostly work with the Antioch Earth team. And I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I really appreciate having them come out to the, to the refuge in Antioch. And they're a lot of help, especially with uh, the, the non-native invasive plants like, like the Russian thistle. Um, and yeah, I really miss you guys out there. <laughs> so I've been going out just briefly, uh, just within the last two or three weeks to, to, to work on some of those invasive plants and do some uh, fire break work. But um, it's a pleasure to work with the the students and um, and and I really appreciate y'all's help. Um, so hopefully next year we'll we'll have you out as well. But uh, good job, thanks a lot, and I uh, hope you all have a good uh, summer. <laughs> Thank you, Louis. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is uh, Tracy here from the Globe Program. And uh, uh, two things. The first comment is, you know, bravo to everybody. Um, great job at presenting what you did and how you felt about it. Um, sometimes that's really hard in these distance 
uh, <laughs> virtual meeting uh, settings. I wish we could have had a, a student research symposium for you guys because I think you guys would have would have rocked everybody's world in those things. And once again, um, uh, the Earth Team uh, uh, interns always, always are best in show at those at those events. So. Uh, no, no less here. Uh, well done on that. And the second thing I wanted to say was, um, I really appreciated uh, working with you specifically on your data collection, but more than that, how important you felt looking at the data was. And I think sometimes we get, we, we get caught up in the collection of the data and we don't get, uh, donate enough time and energy into understanding what the story the data is telling us. And I thought all three groups did a great job at telling that story uh, in their presentations. And I really appreciate that. So well done, everybody. And it was a pleasure to work with all of you, um, <laughs> at least up until March, yeah. <laughs> um, physically and then virtually. Uh, had a great time. So thank you so much. Thanks, Tracy. This is Joelle. I just wanted to say hi to everybody and say that I have had the pleasure of hearing about all of your great work um, from Charlie and Etel all year long. Um, both of them have just had amazing things to say about all three of the teams that we got to hear from today. Um, and I've just been so impressed with the work that you guys have done throughout the year um, into March, and then um, just even more impressed with how resilient everyone's been in the last uh, few weeks as things have become really challenging. Um, the amount of work that you guys put into transitioning to virtual meetings and the commitment you guys showed to the projects and to your team members and to Earth Team was just really, um, you know, moving and special to me. So I'm just really grateful that we get to have uh, high school students on our teams that are so um, committed and, and smart and driven and represent Earth Team as like the best that I could possibly imagine. So I'm just really proud of all of you and really grateful that I got to hear about your work. Thanks, Joel. Joel is, um, for those of you who don't know, she's our Earth Team Program Director. So she was a coordinator last year for Skyline and now she's kind of doing all the behind the scenes work for Earth Team. This is Svetlana speaking. Um, I'm with West Ed and Globe. Um, and I'm on the research side, and I wanted to just commend all of you. It was so, so impressive. And uh, we've been doing interviews or focus groups with all of you over the last month or so, as you probably remember. And it's just been, it's really um, impressive to see how all the things that you told us in the focus group really uh, 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 turned into these fantastic projects and this is incredible evidence of of all the things that you have shared with us um, and uh, just to the partners and to the coaches um, as you probably know the students um, talked about the importance of the relationships um, with all of you both as coaches but also as professionals um, who um, are there to inspire and work with them and um, it's clear that um, you're your influence was, you know, has really um, turned into something amazing. So congratulations to all of you. Thanks. Um, again, Lisa Anich from Contra Costa Resource Conservation District and um, have really enjoyed working with you. And I know that Elisa Robinson has worked at the Antioch Group and um, um, thinks very highly of you all and, um, um, really appreciate that help. Um, and also the Friends of Pinole Creek Watershed. It's really been great to have a partnership with Earth Team. We're doing much different kinds of things than we could do um, by ourselves. So it's a, it's a really fantastic partnership. And um, thanks to you uh, student interns and leaders. And I think you're doing a great job of um, youth leadership on environmental issues. So thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, this is Charlie. I am Skyline uh, Earth Team Coordinator. And I just want to uh, share my reflection very quickly. And, uh, you know, Earth Team was my first year. This is my first year at Earth Team. And hands down, this has been my favorite job that I have ever had. And it's just because I get to work with these incredible young minds who have so much 
enthusiasm and interest in um, changing the world and making it a better place. And I know it sounds cheesy, but it really does give me hope for the future of our planet. So thank you all for participating and all of your hard work this year. And I also want to invite any um, Skyline interns to share their reflections. I guess I'll go. <laughs> um, I'm going to say I've been in Earth Team for three years. I have been with Joel. <laughs> um, it's uh, and Charlie, they all been great instructors. I also met the other instructors from Earth Team. They are awesome. And I just want to say great job. I uh, what you guys do and keep doing it. Thanks for sharing, Hunter. Awesome. If there's any other interns um, who'd like to share any reflections or any final words, um, you're all more than welcome to right now. Hi, um, my name is Zoe. I'm, I'm not an intern. Is, is it all right if I share a reflection <laughs> real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Zoe. Hi. So, um, my name is Zoe, and I work for an organization called Bay Area Community Resources. Uh, we run this Bridge to Career um, Sustainability Fellowship Program called Climate Corps, which I encourage all the interns to, to think about in the future down the line. Um, you can get my info from Charlie or Itzel or Joelle mm -hmm. if you want. Um, but I, I just wanted to share that um, I work really closely with Charlie, and I've been hearing about all of your work and your projects, particularly the Skyline team all year and it's it's um it's really amazing to hear it from you all directly and um on a personal note like I, I grew up in Oakland and Berkeley and I have a lot of friends that went to Skyline and I didn't even know this program was there. Um so it's it's really exciting to to hear from you all and hear about the um important work you're doing and leading the students um over there so so thank you all for the incredible work that you're doing and for sharing it and uh, congratulations on finishing out the year thank you um i'll just say a couple of things um i've been working with a couple of you for two years now um all the seniors who are graduating soon um and even all my new students who just joined this year it's been so much fun to get to know you throughout the year and get to work with you. Um, this job doesn't feel like a job most of the time. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like I'm just hanging out with friends on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so you've all been really great and I can definitely see how your professional skills have built and how your um, interest in the environment has definitely grown. Um, and as Charlie said, I definitely have so much hope um, for the state of our climate and the state of the environment because of how much you all care about um, these issues and how much you all care about spreading the word about um, environmental issues in your own communities. So thank you all for being so great and thank you all for participating um, at meetings and always being so active um, and literally just responding to my remind sometimes. Like it means a lot when people text me back. So you guys have all been really, really great. Okay. I just wanted okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say that um, coming from like a different school district and moving to another city again, it was really good like for me to be able to make a bond with Panol itself. I feel like if I would have never joined Earth Team, I would have just been like, oh, I'm just in another city. Like, I'm gonna go to another one. So like, I feel like this really made a very good impact on my life. So thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. All right, I think we can wrap things up. Um, so once again, thank you to um, all our project partners who joined us today, um, whether you were a partner from Globe, from the county, from school, um, Thanks, it means a lot that you've all supported us throughout the year and that you're still here today um, listening in on these presentations. It really means a lot to me and to our students as well, I'm sure. 